Now what else does the Spirit do? Back in Galatians, right after chapter 3, verse 26, we find this passage in verses 27 through 29. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Being baptized or immersed into water has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on here. This has to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whereby the Holy Spirit baptizes the person into Christ and his body. After this happens with Cornelius in Acts 10, 44-45, this incident is used as the model to settle the matter doctrinally in Acts 11 and in Acts 15. Peter makes the big connection when it happens and then tells about it in Acts 11, 15-16, where he finally gets on board with what Jesus was trying to tell him back in Acts 1, 5, while Peter was too busy worrying about the kingdom and not paying attention in class, as verse 6 shows back in Acts 1. After a person believes the gospel, the Holy Spirit baptizes that person into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. And then in verse 27, it goes on to say, Now are ye the body of Christ, and members in particular. So have you been baptized into Christ? Have you believed the gospel? If you received and trusted Christ by believing the gospel, then you received the Spirit by faith, and that Spirit puts you into Christ. The sinner is declared righteous, and then dipped into righteous Jesus, forever changing his identity. All this after belief. So back to John 1.12. The Calvinists love to throw John 1.13 at you out of context in an effort to prove to you that the Gnostic order of salvation has validity, but they just keep forgetting verse 12. Remember, context and Calvinism never go together, not one single time. So we've seen John 1.12, the many who received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Very clearly here, those who receive Christ are given power to become the sons of God. So how do they become sons of God? They are born again, as we see in chapter 3. When does this happen? It happens after they believe. Because this power is given to them that believe. They already believe as a basis for being given this power. So they receive Christ and then afterward are born again into sons of God. Now comes verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They'll throw this at you as if you think you are birthing yourself again when you believe. Remember these passages? That's one of those passages. Then we could just believe in whatever we want, and Christ would not have to be the object of our faith. Christ is the object of our faith because it is through Him that we are born again. So we receive Jesus through believing on Him. Then we are born again as complete act of God, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And God gives the power to become sons of God to those that believe. And by the time they are sons of God, they were, past tense, born, now that they have become sons of God, which happened after belief. Now isn't that simple? We're just reading the text and believing exactly what it says. Watch out now, they'll call you an idolater for doing this. They'll call you egotistical because you just read the Bible and believe what it says above the word of these great giants of the faith who believe like they believe. So apparently it's not egotistical to study theology enough to where you can overthrow the word of God, but it is egotistical to believe the word of God over and above a bunch of Gnostic theologians who think they know better than God. I'll never understand that one. 